The Grazadillo School of Business and Management at Pepperdine University proudly presents the Dean's Executive Leadership Series. This podcast invites top business practitioners and thought leaders to share their view on the real world of business. For lunch, and it was supposed to be like a meet and greet for like 30 minutes, and three hours later, we were still chatting up a storm. I was an alum of Seaver College, and she shared a vision about the Dean's Executive Series where they would showcase and have very, very important C-level individuals that would speak to the graduate students, to alumni about their vision and what they're doing in the corporations, and they were looking for sponsorship. Well, eight years later, Farmers Insurance has been the uh, sponsor, very proud sponsor of the Dean's Executive Leadership Series. I didn't introduce myself. I'm Faye McClure. I'm the Vice President of Strategic Marketing for Farmers Insurance and a very, very proud supporter of Pepperdine Grazio School of Business Management. Uh, Dean Livingstone has, is a visionary. She is an inspiration. She is someone who has helped lead a campaign finance uh, committee where they've raised over 17 millions over, over the last three years, and just really has uh, put Pepperdine, I think, on the map when it comes to relevance and importance and how, the, how globally we are viewed. So it is my distinct honor, pleasure, and I might say she's from Oklahoma City or Oklahoma, and they have a basketball team that aspire to be like our Lakers, but not quite. <laughs> But I root for them anyway because of my friendship with Linda, D. Linda Livingstone, everyone. Thank you, Faye. I have enjoyed so much the friendship that Faye and I have developed over the years, and we deeply appreciate uh, the Farmers Partnership, and it's been wonderful. If you don't know, uh, Farmers Insurance Group has connections to Pepperdine from years and years ago. Uh, John Tyler Drive on the Malibu campus is named for the founder of Farmers Insurance, so it's a, a great legacy that Pepperdine and farmers have. And uh, the Thunder is are going to beat the Lakers in the playoffs <laughs> one of these days. <laughs> you just wait. I, I can see. <laughs> Well, uh, one of the things I always like to do with these before we bring our speaker up is give you a bit of an update on some of the great things that are going on in the school. Uh, we know you care deeply about that as alumni and friends, and it's always exciting because we have these about once a month, and there's always wonderful and interesting new things that have happened since the last one, so I love telling people about it. Two things I want to mention just real briefly. We have two of our faculty that received recognitions recently that I think indicate how significant what they are doing is, not just for the school, but just nationally. Uh, Michael Crook who has founded, is working on with Dr. Mark Malinger, where's Mark? Mark kind of founded our SEER program, and Dr. Crook came in, and he's the former president and CEO of Patagonia, and was recently named one of North America's top 100 thought leaders in trustworthy business behavior uh, by the Trust Across America group. And so a wonderful recognition. Uh, people like Warren Bennis have gotten it, the Starbucks founder, Howard Schultz. So it's a not notable group. And so we appreciate what he's doing and the leadership that Dr. Mallinger provided in developing that program. We're also proud that Dr. John Paglia, one of our finance professors, who uh, had the vision for our private capital markets project, uh, was recently named the middle market thought leader. Uh, he, uh, this is awarded by the Alliance of Merger and Acquisitions Advisors. Uh, in that private capital markets project, we just rolled out our 2012 economic forecast, and you actually have a brochure in your seat about a certificate program we have in that. So if that's an area you have interest, you should attend that. It's a fabulous program and really unique compared to what anybody else is doing across the country. Well, some upcoming events you need to know about. Uh, we love this event, but we have a lot of other things going on in the school. Uh, on Friday, March 2nd, on the Malibu campus, we are hosting the second annual Hollywood IT Summit. It is the largest gathering of 
IT professionals in Hollywood, and the program's being developed under the direction of an advisory board representing all major movie and television studios. It's a great opportunity for those folks to come together and think about how they do their work more effectively. So I have talked to some of you already that are planning to be there. It's going to be a, an amazing event. We actually had to move it from the Drescher campus down to the lower campus because it was too big this year for our uh, facility up at Drescher. So that's actually a really good problem to have. And we almost have that problem tonight. Blake, you're so popular. We like have standing room only. It's excellent. Uh, full-time students. How many full-time MBA and MS students do we have in the room? We have some. Uh, the full-time program has a group called Challenge for Charity. It is a group that kind of competes friendly with some of the top, other top MBA programs on the West Coast to raise money and to volunteer time for charity. And so they are hosting on Saturday, March 10th, a, a, t a 5K run. You can run 10K if you'd like to, but it's a 5K <laughs> run. Uh, I would prefer not to run 10K. but. It is a 5K run. It starts at 9 o'clock at Zuma Beach. So if you'd love a beautiful Saturday morning in Malibu, and there have been some really pretty ones recently, uh, you should come to that, help raise some money, uh, support our full-time students. It's a wonderful program. And at the end of the year, they all go uh, to Northern California together and, and uh, play together and, and share their hours. So it's a great way for all of us to support that program and, and do a good thing for charity. And then um, another kind of exciting thing for us, we uh, had for a while a campus in Pasadena, and for a variety of reasons we closed that campus, but now we are actually moving back into that area for our, with our part-time MBA program to help serve the Pasadena area and the San Gabriel Valley. Um, and so we are kicking off a, an MBA program out there that will kind of share classes with a Pasadena location and then our West LA or Encino campuses. So we have information sessions on March 6th and April 3rd at the Share Sheraton Pasadena Hotel. So if you know of anyone out in that region that might be interested in a Pepperdine MBA, be sure to tell them about that. Uh, we have lots of staff in the room that can give you more details about that as well. And certainly if you know of others that might be interested in our programs, let us know. We get our best referrals uh, from our alumni because you know uh, the kind of people that would be good in our program, uh, you know the value of our program, and uh, so folks that are referred to us do, a, do an exceptional job when they go through the degrees that we have. And then the last thing I want to mention uh, before I introduce Blake, uh, our next Dean's Executive Leadership Series is March 15th, so not too far off, a couple of weeks. It will be on the Malibu campus uh, at our, our Drescher Auditorium, and we will be featuring Jerry West, who you all know from his days uh, as a Laker. Yes. And uh, he's a member of the NBA Hall of Fame. He's now a consultant with the Golden State Warriors. He joined us last year for uh, Paul Hopkins' event, our last Dells of the year. Uh, and it was fabulous having them there. And so Faye, Faye gets credit for this. She talked him into coming back. Uh, so that will be just an amazing event. I, of course, was a basketball player, so I'm like in awe that he's actually coming to speak at our event. Uh, so I hope you will be there. It will be a really great opportunity for all of us. But tonight is a great opportunity as well. We are thrilled to have Blake Irving with us. Uh, he's the Executive Vice President and Chief Products Officer of Yahoo, but far, far more important than that, he's an alumni of Pepperdine and the Grazia Dio School. And so we are always thrilled to bring back a member of our own family to be a part of this event uh, and to see our alumni doing so well in very challenging circumstances, uh, but really doing some interesting and exciting things. Um, and I'm going to let him talk about the, the things that he's doing and the work at Yahoo, but he's had a great background at Microsoft, at Xerox, he was at Compaq, and uh, it was interesting, I was reading the announcement about when he went to Yahoo, and I guess it was in April of uh, 2010, so almost two years ago, and then he kind of wrote an announcement out to the employees at Yahoo that I found on the internet, and I thought it was interesting because the thing that he talked about, about why he was so excited about going there, was because of the people at Yahoo and the tremendous skill and expertise and all the and passion that they brought to what they were doing. And um, I thought that was a really wonderful way for him to in introduce himself. And I think it says a lot about the kind of person he is. I know we actually have uh, people in the audience that were students of Blake's when he taught for us for a while. And so uh, they have wonderful things to say about him from those experiences. So. Uh, an extremely successful business person, a stellar teacher when he taught for us, and uh, uh, we're very proud that he's alumnus of the, of the Grazia Dio School. So I welcome Blake Irving. Uh, Nick and Chris, uh, sorry if this feels like a class <laughs> to you. Um, it, it won't. 
it'll be it'll be quite quite different. Linda, thank you so much. I'm I'm honored to be uh, to be able to make the flight down from the Bay Area just a little while ago to to be here uh, speaking with you today. I'm going to be a little provocative. I'm not going to talk a lot about Yahoo. I'm going to talk about technology and kind of where it's going, and a lot of you already know where it's going. Um, and then I'll open it up to questions, and I don't suppose any of you will have questions about Yahoo, <laughs> for the most part. I'm sure it will just be relevant to what I'm about to talk about. So uh, not, not wanting to, to be uh, unprovocative, I thought I'd start with a quote from Jack Welch <laughs> that shows tremendous insight from one of our, one of our probably busiest business leaders at the time. Well, the, the, the interesting thing about the quote, and uh, th this was taken very, very seriously at the time, was like, wow, the internet is real. <laughs> 10 years ago, wow, it's real, I can't believe it. And it's really for big business. Does anybody know that's wrong? <laughs> now, fast forward 10 years, and there's so many technologies that have changed the nature of the way the internet is perceived is built upon, the way it accelerates entrepreneurialism around the planet. Let's just use a couple of examples. There are, uh, maybe no, known to some of you, we all love Amazon, right? Great store for just about everything, right? They also run two programs, one called AWS Amazon Web Services and EC2, which is a compute backend that you can actually go lease or buy compute power. So and they have data centers and racks of these things where you might not even know that one of your popular websites is actually running on Amazon. So it turns out that if you're in the venture, cap venture capital business, you used to actually look pretty hard at a new internet startup and say, okay, I gotta really think, think hard about this one because I'm gonna have to go buy capital, I'm gonna have to put it in a data center, shine that data center up, get it running, I'm gonna spend a lot of money on boxes, and now those days are absolutely gone. What little startups can do now is say, I've got an idea. I'm gonna code it up in my house. In fact, b believe this or not, this is a recently quoted uh, fact that I think was Wall Street Journal. 50% uh, of new businesses, new internet businesses, are started in the home. Couldn't say that 10 years ago because it was for big business. Now, so now, now here we are, and anybody use uh, Foursquare? Pretty popular website, AWS. So you're using AWS as well. Foursquare is actually running on the back of AWS. So it's, there are a lot of commercial services that are servicing 20 million, 30 million people that are running on somebody else's platform and it is accelerating at crazy, crazy speed. Venture capitalists don't have to spend the money anymore. They can just fund an idea and just you know, put a couple hundred thousand into it at a time where it's almost like angel investing. Very, very quick. And I was talking to Linda about this earlier. The way that we actually conceptualize business plans and writing a detailed business plan and making sure that we've got everything buttoned up before we go ask for capital, which is pretty typical, you actually are in a position now where you can even go as far as having an idea, mocking it up, running it on top of somebody else's infrastructure, somebody else's infrastructure without making any expensive payments on it, trying it out, get customer feedback, and actually seeing what your customers are doing because you actually put metrics into your product and you can watch people interact with it, everybody. And you can get metrics back at the end of the day to see what feature they used and what feature they didn't use. And if you think about the auto industry today, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of technology in automobiles today. Imagine if Ford, when they sell a new car, could actually tell exactly what features you were using in the automobile. And I, I, I don't mean OnStar. I mean, what buttons you pushed, what parts of the interior you touched, how many times you sat in the seat. That's sort of what the web technology has become. You can prop up a product, prop up an idea, see how users are doing it, and then you can change it the next day. And you can change it the next day without changing stock on a shelf, without doing any kind of thing with inventory, without contacting a customer. You just introduce a new feature or you pull one down and it didn't exist, ever. 
Now, if you have a Facebook account, you're going to see that maybe some of those things that you thought didn't exist, they turn up as soon as you do timeline. I don't know how many of you have done that yet, but <laughs> judging by the lack of giggles, nobody. But uh, anyway, so on to the next topic. So these little devices are, are, are pretty powerful. How many people are carrying a smartphone? Almost everybody in this room. Four years ago, I could have asked the same question and maybe 25% of the hands in the room would have gone up. That's how fast things are moving. At Yahoo, we're, we and, and other companies as well are actually developing software and developing services on top of those devices, for those devices specifically, and then moving them back to this old traditional thing called the PC. Right, and it, I'll, in the next slide, I'll, I'll say why that's actually relevant and why it matters. But if you think about engineering and you think about where some of the web standards are going when you have a phone, and if you think about cloud computing, because that's what we were just talking about, I can actually have a large data center somewhere on the planet, don't know where it is, actually it doesn't really matter, it's not relevant, besides speed of light problems. And I can have an experience on my phone, I can actually take it to another phone, I can put it on this PC that this presentation is on, or in many cases even put it on my TV set. Right? It's, it's left the desktop. And I know that we all spend a lot of time on our PCs and we love them, and the, the, there's a whole demographic in a lot of the planet that actually doesn't even pay attention to them hardly anymore, unless they've got to write a term paper, or they've got to go to an internet kiosk and fill out some real paperwork. Um, so it's, it's quite different. And, wh and when, if you, if you think about, I'll, I'll get into the, the, the bigger international picture in a minute. If you think about the power of these devices, what do they know? They know where you are, they know where you're going, if you have GPS turned on, right? They know where you're going. If you mix that data, and the internet, quite honestly, is all about big data and what you're gonna do with it. They mix that data with the data of all the things that happen to be around you, and you can do amazingly fantastic, wonderful things with it. Now if I use an example, there's a, I think not on this phone, but on this phone, I have something that is called um, Shop Savvy. Has anybody used it? So a few of you have. So what Shop Savvy allows you to do, you actually can walk up to a barcode. Does anybody have a bottle of Aquafina or something like that? Okay, well, I won't demonstrate. I can't, it's hard to do a presentation without a demo for me, sorry. Um, and you can actually walk up with your phone, scan it, scan the item, so you've got one there. So this is an arrowhead, so let's go to the, let's find this, this is a fascinating little deal. Say so scan a barcode, and I will literally put the barcode in reach. Takes a photograph of the barcode, if I can steady my hand. I can't. <laughs> let's try this. And it'll come back and tell me Arrowhead this basically says Arrowhead Mountain Spring water, and there are like 20 local stores within where I'm standing right now that can offer me deals on it. <laughs> offer me deals on it. We did, a, um, we did something actually with a company we, we acquired called Into Now, and Into Now actually has a technology called Soundprint that listens to the TV set and then can tell you exactly what's on the TV set and then pull up from a corpus of data from a very large uh, database in the back end and give you things that are happening similarly at that moment, at that moment in time. And it is unbelievably powerful for marketers because you can actually listen to a commercial and have the screen that's your TV and your handheld device, whether it's a tablet or a phone, give you relevant data about the commercial, throw up a coupon onto your phone and you can walk in and redeem from your TV. And, and it's local, it's on the TV set, it's on the handset, and it's all using big data. So, back to these little devices we were talking about earlier. Most of the planet 
is going to be getting on the internet with phones, period. They'll never touch a PC. In fact, if you went to Indonesia or you went into India, they're not even smartphones, they're actually feature phones. Smartphones are a little bit expensive to run. So a feature phone is one of those phones that actually doesn't have a full screen, has a small screen, doesn't have a big operating system, doesn't have a lot of memory, yet you can still do mail, you can get on the internet with them, and most of the people, whether they're in a demographic of being quite young or being a mother or a grandmother, are getting on the internet with wireless devices and that's what the future is. So while you might think of the, this little device as being the, the sidekick for your PC and sometimes you use it and you hate having to actually type anything on it because it's really awkward, there's a whole demographic that's not represented in this room that believes that's just the way it is. And when I get on that old clickety clackety thing, you know, I, it's just for school. In fact, I, I follow a, um, I follow somebody uh, in Twitter, and his, uh, when the, I think it was the MacBook Air, when the MacBook Air was announced, and there was much to do in the Bay Area about it, said, his kid said, and he tweeted this, Dad, is the MacBook Air an iPad for old people? <laughs> because I had a keyboard, right? It's like virtual keyboards. Is anybody confounded by virtual keyboards? Or at least autocorrect? Come on, on autocorrect, you gotta, you gotta be there. Kids don't care, you know, they just don't care. And it just is, and that's, that's what the future is. So the PC, start thinking of that as your sidekick because that's where we're going. Okay, mobile commerce. I just showed you an example of mobile commerce. There's a wonderful opportunity on the internet that's basically closed loop advertising. And if you think about closed loop advertising, you know, you're on the internet and you see some really wonky advertisement that doesn't have any relevance to you. Um, I, I don't know how many, how many advanced degrees are represented in the room, but I guarantee you, you've been marketed for an advanced degree regardless if you have one or not. Because targeting technology is not quite up to snuff. There's a big third party arbitrage business going on in advertising on the web today which degrades quality of advertising. There is a trend, and it's just starting to emerge, that is about closed loop advertising where you're going to see an advertisement that is actually targeted to you because you've signed the terms of service, because you're in love with what they do for you, and you say, yeah, you can advertise to me and you can make it relevant. You know, most folks that actually subscribe to magazines spent as much time on the advertisements as they do on the content. Why? Because you asked for it. I subscribe to Auto Week, I subscribe to Motor Trend, I subscribe to Golf Digest, I subscribe to all this stuff that are about my personal passions. Now, if you knew that about me, and you could produce an advertisement to me that ended up on this device, I saw Golf Digest on the web, I was given an advertisement, I was in a logged in state, you know who I am, I have an advertisement on this device because I've logged in on Golf Digest as well, I walk into a store, I say scan this coupon, I execute it, I've advertised on the web, I've actually gone all the way to the purchase of the good or the service. And I love it as a consumer. So the controversy right now, sort of, if you're a, a web user and you're, you know, you're getting free services, like the web's free, right? Not, not really, it's monetized, makes a lot of money. Google, Facebook, Yahoo, they all make a pretty good amount of money. And there's an entire emergence of folks that do are all going to be moving into what I'd call real commerce. Has anybody heard of a company called Square? Is anybody using Square as a merchant? There's one person in the room. This little device that you see at the bottom of, of this iPhone, and I've got both their, their app, I have their merchant app and their, uh, and their consumer wallet on this device, this little guy actually allows you to put that little cube into your iPhone and scan cards. So if you've got your phone with you, you're in your store. And if you think about the power of trying to create commerce for some little startups who are a little bit intimidated by how do I become a store, how do I actually start marketing goods and services, all you need to do is register on the site, they'll send this to you free of charge, you upload your data, you accumulate, attach your bank account to it, 
to the software that's on your iPhone or your Droid, and off you go. Not only that, if you have the wallet software on your phone, you can actually walk up to somebody who's running their software at point of purchase, and it knows that you have an account or a relationship with them. And if you imagine the coffee scenario, which is the one that they like to use on their website, it would actually know that I'm coming up. It would know, hi, Blake. Here's your latte before I got to the counter. It would debit me. I'd pick it up, say thank you very much, and off I go. What does is, what is the, what is the, um, the business get in return? Data. Tons of data. And it's all about this amazing amount of metricized information you can get about me that makes my experience better, forms a relationship between me and the business, and makes the business so much more powerful. And it's just, it's just simple, super simple scenarios that are so darn practical you just say, well, is that really technology? I, I don't know. So let's talk about social for a minute, just to completely morph to a completely different, and I know, again, this isn't a demographic that's you know, on Facebook 24 seven, but the trend and what VCs are funding right now in the Bay is about real social relationships. And it is central to you know, kind of the most meaningful experiences you can have online. Bless you. Donata. So, um, give, give you an example. So, who has a, who has a Facebook account here? Just look at that. So, it's, it's the demographic is wide and deep. Who has more than 200 people in their Facebook group? Come on, be honest. 500. A, a lot of you. Right? So, I, I'm up to, I think, 1,300 or some stupid number. There's a, 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 a pretty well-known um, scientist at Yahoo named Duncan Watts. And Duncan published a paper that's premise was between zero and 500, you're going to choose zero. And his premise was about, um, you know, if you're going to do a broadcast of something that's highly personal, you're going to think about it. <laughs> you're going to think twice about it, and then you're not going to write anything. Now, it starts to, uh, that, that theory starts to erode when you move down in uh, age. Right. But it doesn't go away. And I'll give you two examples. I have two kids. One's a senior in high school, one's a freshman. Go back a year, the eighth grader gets a uh, Facebook account. For eighth grade, he's in eighth grade, he gets a Facebook account, as long as dad's on his Facebook list. So he starts using his Facebook account, and uh, he changes his relationship status to in a relationship. <laughs> so, I post something on his wall about being in a relationship and like, huh? <laughs> and, uh, and then I watch as all his buddies just like, just start beating him up. I mean, just giving him a hard time about this girl or is it a guy or, you know. <laughs> I mean, for, for pretty funny stuff. And my son is so like embarrassed. He changes his relationship status to single again and inadvertently breaks up with his girlfriend <laughs> because, <laughs> She learns on Facebook that he's broken up with her. Now, so uh, of the fa uh, Facebook guys have been you know, good friends of mine for a long time, and I was actually at a wedding for the guy who runs Facebook Mobile at, uh, in Monterey. And I live in San Luis Obispo, so I'm about 100 miles away from home. Um, and I'm at a table at the reception, and there's some, you know, some eBay guys and a couple of ex-Microsofties and some VCs and a couple of Facebook people. And we're sitting there, and I get a... I get a I get a status update on my phone. It says, epic party at Parker's house. <laughs> well, my, my wife and I had left town the day before with, you know, this is your first time to show that you're a responsible guy. We're going to leave you and your brother home. You're 17. It's all good. <laughs> Parker's my son, as it turns out, right, of course. And there's a raging party, apparently, <laughs> going on at his house. And... His buddy forgot that it would be really cool to add Parker's techno dad to his Facebook group. So he sends out a status update to all his high school friends and forgets, forgets that he copied Parker's father. Right? <laughs> so it starts at a pretty young age. Right? And the way that people actually interact is in small groups around stuff that you really care about. 
And if you think about your life in general, you might have people that you uh, go dancing with. You might have people that you talk politics with. You might have people that are your, in your religious group, what, whatever it is. But it's not everybody. So the broadcast social mechanism that we have today, and everybody will, sit, will tell you, social is done. It's called Facebook. It starts to ring untrue over time and starts to turn into small groups of people that are passionate about things um, that they have in common. It's just emulating life, right? And, and that's what people really want the web to do. They want it to create meaning, which they find in life. And I like to, I like to use a, a statement that like, the internet's all about relevance. And it's not about meaning, and nobody's really done a good job doing it. You know? And yogis don't go to mountaintops looking for relevance, they go looking for meaning. And the internet has not delivered it, not yet, right? None of us have. It's, frankly, it's my, my mantra for my group at the company is bring personal meaning to the web. And nobody has delivered on it because nobody has that trust relationship with, with you, the one that you have with yourself or your psychotherapist, whoever you tell everything to. Usually it's only you. Crowdsource content. If you're on Facebook, you're a publisher. You ever thought about that? You might have small viewership or small readership, but you're a publisher. My 16-year-old, now, now my 17-year-old, and my 14-year-old, they're publishers, and they have a readership. My son's got a readership of oldest son, about 1,000 people, and that's what they're in. Like, if you have a Twitter feed, you're a publisher. We actually purchased a company uh, called Associated Content that has roughly 500,000 Enthusiast writers, some of which are unbelievably good and domain experts. And they write because they love it. Now, what we, what we actually found was that some of these guys, when you start publishing their articles, their articles actually monetize really well. So we bought this company, Associated Content, that has the mechanics of actually determining how somebody scores on a monetization perspective and how much they should be paid by the stuff that they're writing. So if you start thinking about Crowdsourced, and crowdsourced just means anybody in this room could be an author. It's the internet. You don't have to have a publisher. You don't have to have a relationship with Penguin Books to go get your ideas published. You can just do it, and people will find you. They will read you if they're interested in your stuff. And if you're smart in the way that you actually develop the, and most of the blogging platforms do this already, they're search engine optimized so you can be found, um, you'll be read by a lot more people than you thought. And so, if you think about that and start applying it to business and not, not about just authorship, and when I've spoken at small business events, and I did one in the Central Coast, I, I impressed upon the, the folks in the, in the room, and they were all small business people, brick and mortar for the most part, that every person in their company is a marketer, every, every one of them. The service person, the sales person, the person at the cash register, the person who's taking out you know, the garbage, whatever it happens to be, because if anybody in that store, in your brick and mortar facility, has a bad experience, they're a publisher. What they're gonna do is they're gonna go up and they're either gonna go to Yelp, they're gonna go to Facebook, they're gonna go to Twitter, they're gonna go to Foursquare, they'll go to, uh, I don't know, th throw out another one. Reddit. What? Reddit. Reddit. Uh, the, the, there are so many places for you to actually get your idea out. And if your idea is about somebody's business and a bad experience, it goes like wildfire. Because we all know that negative news travels, I don't know how much faster than positive news? Lots. Right? So think about that. And think about the power of every customer being a publisher when they come into your business and they're going to be able to you know, transmit a wonderful story or a pretty tough, pretty tough story, even if you're a service provider. Maybe more so if you're a service provider. So, that's the truth. You know, entrepreneur over big business. Yeah, Jack was right 10 years ago, and it was mostly big business that could afford it because it took a lot of money and a lot of capex, a lot of capital expenditure to actually stand up an internet service. You had to be really, you had to know exactly what you were going to do. You don't anymore. You can experiment. You can have an idea, you can actually form that idea, do a good job with it, experiment, get feedback from your customers, and go like crazy. 
And for those of you who are in school, for those of you who are freshly out of school, for those of you who are thinking about doing something else, for those of you who are thinking about taking your small business and making it bigger, or taking a little tiny business and making it look giant because nobody knows how big you are on the web, there's, there's nothing like it. Pretty fun place to experiment and a great place to work, actually. So, thanks. Thank <laughs> you.